Welcome back to MongoDB TV here at the Javits Center in New York City. Local. I have a special guest here, uh, Henry Weller. He is a product manager at MongoDB. Uh, great to have you again, Henry. You've been on the live stream. Uh, if you were just watching in the break, that was uh, me and Henry uh, chatting about vector search there, and that's what we're going to talk about today, vector search as well. So welcome back. Great to be back. Nice. Yeah. Amazing. So there was uh, one announcement today of vector search is coming to the community edition. So you'll be able to use search and vector search locally on, on your machine. Mm -hmm. uh, any, any words to say about that? Yeah. Um, I think we've learned a lot about people liking to use frameworks with vector search that are often free to use. Mm -hmm. And so we know that the, there's some friction sometimes in signing up for a cloud service uh, alongside using a framework, people sometimes want to start locally and then graduate up to yeah. a fully managed service. So sort of a natural decision. It's, there's also a set of customers that want to run things on their own servers. So this is like a good mm -hmm. path to that. Exactly. Exactly. Amazing. I think it's a great, a great uh, step as well. Um, you're going to be giving a talk in just a bit, right? I already gave it. Oh, you, you already gave yeah, it. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm getting everything mixed up. <laughs> you, you just gave a talk <laughs> yeah, yeah. about modeling data uh, in, ve in vector search. So uh, give us like the, the highlights of, of your talk. Sure. Like, um, I guess taking a step back, the last time we spoke, we were talking yeah. about HNSW. Yes. Um, and I think like thematically talking about the mechanics of vector search has mm -hmm. been a very common thing in the past year, yeah. not just with us, but with a lot of vector databases, um, you know, dedicated vector databases. And I think talking about the how of how embeddings work and talking about how HNSW indexes work, mm -hmm. you kind of get a little bit focused into the weeds and you miss like the big picture mm -hmm. sometimes about yeah. like what actually am I doing vector search for? Right. Uh, what is information retrieval? What are other methods that can help me improve my search problem? And how does data modeling fit into that? Yeah. And so I've kind of felt like from a lot of customer conversations, they understand sort of like the getting started experience, yeah. but they don't know exactly how to iterate yeah. and improve, you know, their search problem, improve the quality of the results they get, know how much, how many results to give to an LLM. Right. And sort of trying to take some of those warnings and bring together sure. those practices and sort of talk about that. Sure. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with, with data modeling. It's yeah. sort of the one way you can really experiment with different patterns within our system. You can always try things where you experiment tweaking the parameters mm -hmm. of a model or maybe even trying to fine tune an embedding model, but that can be sort of hard to reason about relative to a data model, which yeah. is a pretty well understood thing. Yeah. Um, and there's many best practices that have been established for databases. We're trying to get those as well for vector search or other types yeah. of information retrieval as well. Perfect. So when we talk about unstructured data, um, how do you model unstructured data? Right. Great <laughs> question. That is the question. Um, so I guess the first thing to say is with a lot of unstructured data, you do need to like find ways of pulling out the implicit structure. Yeah. So we we generally lean on a lot of our partners who are upstream because we don't you know build a ton of data connectors as a company. We focus mostly on indexing data. Yeah, um, who are capable of pulling out things like you know extracted keywords, relationships between hierarchical documents, even things like if you're building like a Markdown file. Yeah. In a, you, there, there's different headers that indicate where different contents should live. Um, these sorts of things are inherent structure where you don't have to just lean on, you know, some arbitrary number of tokens and overlap between s subsequent chunks, mm -hmm. but actually leveraging structure that exists. Um, that's like kind of step one. Um, and then step two is figuring out based on your data, what types of information retrieval patterns are good ideas. Yeah. Content-based methods like vector search or keyword search. Mm -hmm. And then like user-based methods, like feedback-based methods, where you can upvote and downvote different types of documents that are yielded back. Right. Um, sort of really making the, the data that you're trying to retrieve within RAG at the front and center mm -hmm. of those kinds of applications. And not necessarily marginalizing the, the chat model, but limiting the scope of what it does and making sure that it cites its sources mm -hmm. um, so that it's basically responses are much easier to reason about, which we found with a lot of enterprises tends to be like a top priority. Got you it. see like people talk about, you know, all these kind of far out ideas and mm -hmm. ways of using AI. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of like the way into adopting it. But in terms of actually building POCs and deploying them at different parts in the organization, it, it tends to be more practical considerations and data modeling is, is part of that. Yeah. So, oh, you, this, the data might be unstructured, but there is some inherent structure there. And that's where 
um, what what are like the the first step of of figuring out how to model the data? Like, what is the first thing that you would look at, and then uh, and then build upon that to to start mod- putting the data together? Do you have like maybe a use case, an example that we can like have the the, the listeners like envision in their sure. mind? Right. The the use case I gave in my talk was there's a it was a software engineering textbook, or yeah. I guess it's a it's not necessarily a textbook, or it's more of like a popular book called The Philosophy of Software Design. Okay. So if you were to build some kind of best practices, uh, like chatbot for software, this might be the kind of data you would want to consider. Sure. And you would want, if you were to get a tip on you know, what best practices were, to have a citation and a reference. Yeah. So you as the user who is being told about this, or maybe you're writing code that doesn't adhere to some of these best practices, you would want to be able to map to these things. Mm. And then you would want to know what level makes the most sense to map to. Gotcha. And so it's it's a bit of a balance of the right level of context to provide mm-hmm. to an LLM and then the right level of context to embed mm-hmm. and make searchable or use a keyword search system to make searchable. So I gave the example of you have a collection with different sized chunks where you might have a whole page of content that mm-hmm. doesn't get embedded but is indexed with a full search index. Okay. And then paragraphs from that page which are embedded. Okay. And you can make these jointly considered uh, mm-hmm within the aggregation stage. Um, mm-hmm. We have examples in our docs about exactly the code to write to make this work, mm-hmm. but that is just one example of knowing that embedding models that you're using might be more capable at representing some level of context mm-hmm. in keyword search at another level, and then what is provided to the LLM to synthesize a response is its own thing. Mm-hmm. So data modeling is also just separating responsibilities in yeah. a lot of ways. So, so you could model your data basically like you may end up using multiple different models, right? And model your data in a way that um, you, you might have different stages along the way where you're going to a different model for certain tasks, mm-hmm. right? And then and then coming back, is it, am I on track or is that not really... It's, it's funny cause, because model is a very open yeah, yeah. term now in this yeah. case. When I, when I say multiple different things, you might, maybe you vary during your prototyping stage, okay. the type of embedding model you use, sure. but you probably wouldn't want to vary yeah. like what level of data you are if you're varying that. Sure. You might hold the embedding model constant and then vary the chunk mm. sizes or vary the level at which you're embedding it. Yes. Okay. Um, but generally with, with chunking, there's like the, the method I mentioned where you're considering the headers of the files and the implicit structure. And then there's the other another approach, which is more around overlap. And like this level of context is, is capable to be understood, like this number of tokens. And I think generally I, people have seen a lot of success with the first thing but the mm-hmm. second thing is probably uh for some use cases if yeah. you can't extract hierarchy probably the only option that you have yeah okay and also to be clear like a lot of this stuff that that we're talking about uh, a lot of the folks that have like paved the way for figuring out these better methods are like the orchestration frameworks like mm-hmm. Chain and Laman, sure. who are both speaking today as yeah. well so really what i'm thinking about is finding ways of taking a lot of those learnings and trying to model it within the same collection yeah. Right. Re- parent document retrieval is one example. That is when you have, you know, a document that's embedded and then a corresponding higher level of context yeah. that is provided to the LLM. That's there's many other types of examples, but mm-hmm. I think that the state for representing those relationships yeah. should all exist within the database. Because if you were to scale that up to a very large amount, having multiple sources of truth becomes something of a challenge. Amazing. So I think um Oh wow! I just lost my thought. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so we talked about unstructured data. Mm-hmm. That, so AI has been basically it's it's been advancing so quickly, mm. and uh, I think we're at the stage now where everyone is really trying to optimize as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So with data modeling, how does that help with optimization mm-hmm. uh, in different ways? Optimizing for for um, accuracy, optimizing for maybe um, for cost savings, possibly. Um, in what ways would it affect that? So I really like this analogy of scaffolding, uh, where the basically the models themselves and the core underlying capabilities you can expect to keep improving, but you need to build some kind of application today, yeah. given the capabilities that you have. So that's why things like considering a data model, you know, as you're building your system and um, things like LangChain that are, are sure. very popular, uh, chunking at different levels um, and orchestrating things. This is like one of those things to scaffold to sort of get around mm-hmm. the current limitations today or maybe sort of narrow in the scope of what that LLM is supposed to do or what that yeah. embedding model is supposed to do. Embedding models, I think, a lot more about because those I would expect to continue to improve, be able to represent different types of data 
in many different ways. Yeah. But they, they struggle sure. with, with certain types of data. Sure. Structured data and graph data is generally a challenge to map to mm-hmm. the same domain as like a natural language query. Yeah. Um, so you need scaffolding to mm-hmm. be able to capture those relationships generally. Yeah. And I think the history of a lot of machine learning is the history of scaffolding. Mm-hmm. Like you always have folks working on building end-to-end systems. Um, but when you're putting things out in production, often you need to consider a lot of other things. Mm-hmm. It's, it's usually not as simple as just feeding something, everything, and hoping it works. Yeah. It's also a way to generally not have control of the type of application you're building and sort of like deferring it to mm-hmm. some other company. Yeah, which yeah. I think has its own set of risks. Sure. Yeah. Depends on the use case, I guess. Pros and cons. Uh, amazing. Well, so we did not live stream his talk, but we did record it. So it will be posted to YouTube soon. So ch- uh, watch out for that. Uh, and just excited about Vector Search and everything else. If you haven't tried Vector Search yet, uh, go give it a try today in MongoDB Atlas. And uh, Henry, again, thank you for being on. Uh, And we will be back after a quick break with our next guest. Mm